Welcome to the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Welcome to ITSP Magazine Podcast Radio. You're about to listen to an episode of Tech Done Different Podcast with Ted Harrington. Do you follow the pack or challenge the status quo? Join Ted as he explores how to succeed by going against conventional wisdom. You'll hear leaders in technology and security tell stories about how they achieve their success by doing things differently. Knowledge is power. Now, more than ever. CrowdSec, the collaborative and open source cybersecurity solution. Analyze behaviors, respond to attacks, and share signals across the community for free. Let's make the internet safer together. Learn more at crowdsec.net. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Tech Done Different. As always, I'm your host, Ted Harrington, and with me here today is a dear friend, Candice Liu, the, one of the founders at OnPrem, which was recently acquired. Candice, thanks for spending some time with us today. Thanks for having me. Totally. So I'm really excited to talk about the idea of you know, some of the things that you've, you've accomplished professionally, but we could start around the idea of being a woman founder in tech and kind of maybe walk us through that journey. I, I think you were saying that you were literally pregnant as you were starting the company. What are some of the challenges you face? How, how's it been being a female founder in tech? You know, I, I think I think being a founder and being female coincided for me because I was having kids and I needed a way to be able to balance my life. And for me, doing that was was through finding a company, which sounds crazy, but it is a way to be able to control your kind of your schedule and what's expected of you and all of that. So, you know, I think it's hard for women because we expect, and I think it's 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 a self expectation, much less societal, but to be able to do everything, right? We have kids, we gotta be the ones taking care of them predominantly. Obviously we have to carry them, all those other things that, that have to occur. But for me, I also wanted my career. So I, I think I think starting a company was always something I wanted to do even when I was a little kid, but it became a necessity when I started to start up, you know, my own family. I feel like that was the only way to be able to balance it. It's interesting hearing you describe that as a way to find balance because I, yeah, I know, I know. Being an entrepreneur is uh, certainly not a balanced activity. Oh, totally not. And I think balance is defined differently for people, right? Balance doesn't mean I'm working 40 hours a week. Balance just means that I'm working my typical, you know, 60, 70 when you're when you're starting a company. But you have these moments of gaps where you know you're going to be with your kids, right? I'm going to be dropping them off. I want to pick them up from school. I want to be able to go to their plays. And at night, I'm putting them down for, you know, to, to go to bed and then read them stories and later on do homework with them. So for me, balance, which is my ability to be able to call my own schedule, and no one questioning me because they trusted the fact that I was going to get my work done. So it's you, you can't really say that you're going to have work-life balance of just a really nice schedule when you're starting a company, that that's not a thing. You, you can't stop thinking about it. At least I couldn't stop thinking about it. Yeah. I like that definition that you're expressing of balance being really about control and autonomy. That's what I'm sort of hearing you describe. Yeah. No, a hundred percent. I'm lucky that I have founders who just trusted me that they knew that no matter what, they didn't care if it was 2 a.m. on a, you know, in a tree that I was going to get my work done and I was going to bring in what, what they expected of me. They never questioned when it was going to occur. They just knew it was going to happen. So they, they allowed me to have that freedom. So you had that trust with your co-founders. Was that something that had been established before you guys started the company? You already trusted each other or is that something that happens in the process of starting a company? I think I think it's well, it definitely started before because the four of us had worked together for 10 years prior to starting this company. And so at that point, we were really the appointed leaders of one of the founders, Frank Leal, who founded the first company that I had joined. And so he already trusted us to be able to say, hey, you are the ones kind of running the practices within my team. But genuinely, when you start a company together, it only it has to build upon that trust because if it doesn't, you're going to break. If we didn't have the same set of values, if we didn't have the same perspective, especially through these really difficult times, through COVID, through all the different societal you know, occurrences that were happening in the past few years, that would have been really, really difficult. So I think that you, you can't help but trust each other when everything is out in the open, when it comes to starting a company together, you know, all the financials that are happening, you know, where everything is coming from. So it definitely built on that, but it, it wouldn't be as successful as, as it is now if it weren't for the fact that we built that before. Beforehand. One of the things that we struggled with for some time in our company was verbalizing 
the vision, verbalizing the mission. I mean, we obviously had a mission and we had a vision and we'd lived it, but figuring out how to put it into words so that someone who joins the company and has not been experiencing the way we've been approaching it, they know. How did you guys do that? So you set out to start a company. What was the, like, what was the mission? Why did you want to do it? And then how did you verbalize that to everyone else who followed? Well, you know, I think we were lucky in that we knew the positives that came out of our previous experiences. For me, it was all about the culture. For me, it was about creating a place where people were happy and a place where people could support each other within and outside of the company. That was always my mission. There was something very rewarding about that. But tactically, you know, we, I, I was the only one that had an MBA out of the, the, the founders. And I previously had built a business plan for one of the companies that I was at. And it was this like, 80 page, really weighty thing that no one ever reviewed. So in the very beginning, you know, I said, we have to have a mission statement. We have to have our values identified. So I leaned on basically a business model canvas, which is a, a lean startup deliverable that, that's recommended. That's basically a one page that just showcases how you're making your revenue, you know, where your costs are coming from. And then it goes into value proposition, who your customers are. So it gives you the, you know, why we're doing it, what we do for whom, and all of that in one place. So that was one of the first things that we did even before we started the company was just thinking through that business model canvas and then really fleshing that out. So out the gate, we were able to verbalize what we were trying to do you know, just what were our services and then also just identifying our values. So our, our values that we still have today, which one of the first things you see in our website was crafted out of that. Very interesting. And when you think about now the sort of the other end of the story arc, you've achieved what many entrepreneurs hope to achieve someday, which is actually have a successful exit, get the company acquired. Service companies don't typically go public. So you achieved the, the desired outcome. Tell me about that. How did you, was, was this always the goal? Did you want to sell the company? Were you building towards it? How did you get to where you are? Yeah, you know, we, we didn't have that kind of a, at the onset. It was something where we knew we wanted a different culture and we knew we had enough learnings from being with a smaller firm, getting acquired by a larger firm like Cognizant is who acquired us before. We, we just had enough in order to be able to create something that we knew could be successful because we took all the elements that were very positive out of those two experiences and then took away the things that didn't work out so well for us. So we really set out just to create a company that we would we would be happy in and that we would, you know, ultimately just feel good about. And so that was kind of the initial piece of it. We put together a three-year PL and then we looked at it and we laughed and we we're like, that's crazy. Those numbers are are that would be insane if we hit that. And sure enough, we ended up hitting those numbers. And I think the idea of the acquisition really occurred when we were talking about partnerships with Quest Media and then COVID happened. And at that time, it, we were entirely privately held. We, we had never taken an investment. So when you started to look at 200 plus people, you look at the payroll that's happening, you look at COVID, all of a sudden projects started to get pulled away from us. The opportunity to be able to have a, and it was really, a, it's a partial acquisition. So they acquired 55% of the company. So it, it allowed us to be able to have just the financial stability that at that time, it just became really scary. But being able to also, in addition to that, find a company that wasn't going to be the experience that we had, that wasn't just going to take us over and then really like smash our culture to bits. Um, it, it, it allowed us for, for just a clarity in what we wanted from a partner. And thankfully we, we got that from Quest. You know, they're a 300 person company. They're not that large. They don't do what we do. They have no North American presence. We have no global presence. So the synergies that we have across all that really made sense. But honestly, just the, the ability just to look at our employees and be able to say that we, you know, we have that stability, that we don't have to have these conversations about furloughs and things like that that were happening and that you get all these opportunities now because of what we could you know what we could do with with the the partnership was was a lot of the the rationale behind it we we knew what we didn't want from an acquisition because we'd gone through it before it's not worth it a lot of entrepreneurs and not even entrepreneurs people who are employees and work at a company that goes through an acquisition they sometimes can be skeptical that when the buyer comes in and says, no, we're going to leave you guys alone. You've got a good thing going here. We're not going to touch it. And then a lot of times they do, they come in and they step all over it. How did you, how could you determine in advance, which was going to be the case when it came to you getting acquired by Quest? 
Honestly, it's it's really the services matchup, right? I mean, the fact that they do not do the services that we provide. They build satellite and operation like broadcast operations center. It's it's hardware. It's you know, it's a lot of the the network components of it. We don't do that. So we knew that it was going to be additive. So it wasn't like they were, you know, they were looking to come in and really acquire us to get rid of us because we were competing. It was really your services are fantastic. And honestly, throughout throughout the the conversations, they just underlined our culture so much and just said that this is part of the reasons why you're successful. We don't want to change that. And they're so they're, they're small, right? They're just as small as we are. So it's not like there is this operational mechanism to come in and just take over and take over the components of our business that that were so important to us. And, you know, and we had a lot of that defined during during the conversations in regards to what we were able to keep autonomous, like the hiring of executives, things like that, and then what we were going to work with them through. But for the most part, you just had a feeling about it, right? And we just kind of knew the, the reasons why it didn't work out the way that we would have wanted it to work out when Cognizant acquired us. And then comparing it to to this option, we just knew what to look out for. Yeah, so that's good. So you, you went through two subsequent acquisitions with the same company and one went well and one did not. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Yeah, yeah. basically we started out at, at a business school. I joined SVC. We got acquired by Cognizant. I wasn't leadership at that point. So I just watched it happen. And then I watched really this culture that I loved so much just start to get impacted. And then when we spun off and started on-prem, then we got acquired by Quest. And you know, I think what, what was pretty telling is we had an employee survey four months after the acquisition and no one mentioned the acquisition. Maybe there's like one note about just asking about, you know, just potential additional benefits, but no one mentioned it. And still to this day, and it's a year and a half later, people are like, this is, it's not even, you know, we, we, we know what's happened and we, we are, we are in the process of changing our name, which we had been trying to do even before that, because on-prem is not the greatest name when you're, when you provide cloud services. Um, but, you know, our, our employees have been just very, I mean, it, honestly, it hasn't been, it's been like a non-factor, right? In, in that sense of impact, but they know the, the opportunities that this now provides us. So it's all been positive, thankfully. That's pretty remarkable to hear. What I'm hearing you say is that it, it didn't really negatively impact the morale. Acquisitions sometimes can do that where people are afraid, like, will I get fired? Will the people I like working with leave? All that kind of stuff. And you haven't had that experience. And, and I think I, it, I'd be silly to say that it didn't, it, it, had, it had to have impacted morale, right? In the very beginning, because you're always in that stage of what is about to happen. But, but I think that the, at the end of the day, it's like we communicated the whole time. I mean, every, you know, we, we're, we're big about communication. Every month we share our financials to the whole team. During COVID, we were having weekly town halls saying, look at what's about to happen. What do we do? How do we go, you know, go through this together? So throughout the, the stages of it, as it was occurring, when it occurred, all of that, we've always been very upfront about it. So, you know, I think that really helps. And then it just, it's just a showcase that like what we're telling you that it's not going to get impacted happens. And then people just kind of go about their business again. So, you know, I mean, this, the psychology of change is hard. And I know that people went through that when, when the news happened, but there definitely hasn't been, you know, kind of the impact that I had previously seen (laughs) before. Would you say that the way you communicated is the key to why it's gone smoothly? A hundred percent. I mean, I think that's how we've, you know, I, I look at what was happening during COVID and, and we grew stronger out of that, right? I mean, it got to a point where we're sharing, again, our financials and we're like, look at the quarters. This, is, this isn't this is looking good because people were pulling projects just proactively for the first time in the 20 years that we've worked together. So we were sharing that with a team, even people that we just hired from campus. We were having town halls with them. They hadn't even started yet. It got to a point where we asked, you know, would anyone volunteer to furlough? Because the last thing that we want is to be able to blindside people about this, right? And we didn't think anyone would really, you know, kind of agree to it, but 32 people volunteered. And the comments were like, if it helps the firm, like I can afford to, if it helps someone else that needs the job. I mean, the spirit of just being there for the company and being there for each other was so humbling. And I, and I, I do, you know, think that because we were communicating the whole time, that was a, that was the effect of it. So, and then, you know, we were making investments, all that, all of a sudden we were like, oh, just kidding. We don't need to furlough anyone. And everyone, you know, and that everyone just felt like we got through it together. So it was, it was a pretty fascinating case study, I think, of how to kind of get through something like that as a, as a company versus just leadership mandating what should be, what should be done. And, you know, again, I think we, we got out of it stronger because there's that trust that's built because of it. Yeah, that's incredible. I mean, that 
the people who would volunteer to furlough that clearly indicates that they are part of a community that you've built yeah and it wasn't just a job with a paycheck right because they're willing to forego some aspect of it yeah yeah i know that that for me i was like all right that's it i mean if the doors closed tomorrow that would obviously suck but i feel like i've done it all right i've built i've helped build this community where people are just there for each other from a humanity level and that feels pretty good <laughs> Versus just thinking about it all as a transaction. I love that. So how do you think you built that? If we think about the fact that, you know, you can all day long want to create that culture, but ultimately that culture is the people interacting with each other. What, what do you think led to this positive state? So, you know, it, it came back to your first question, right? It's about your values. And for us, it's something that we repeat over and over and over again, you know, integrity, just do the right thing, just lead and, and, and help grow people, support each other, things like that. That's part of our re review process. You're actually reviewed against those values. So I think just always just kind of repeating what we're all about. And then you have to look for that in the people that you hire. You know, you, you have to figure out how to ask questions around whether it's just grit and persistence and just like just the value of team and people not being out just for themselves that I think has really helped. Like I, you know, I, I talk about like the, the no jerk factor. You don't want to hire people. They're just there to, you know, just to be, just to compete and backstab and all of that. So I think it's the nature also of how we interview the questions that we ask, what we look for, and then creating an environment where we provide opportunities for people to just get to know each other. I think the the ability to be vulnerable and just to get to know each other is humongous. And so you you set forth an environment and you lay out that like we want you to be who you are and talk about what interests you. And this isn't, isn't just you're not just here just to do work for us. You know we're here to support each other. I think all of that in combination has led to the culture that we have. I don't think it's that hard, but uh, you know I find we attract people and they're like this is so different and it makes me sad that it's different. But I guess if it makes us successful, I, I will take it. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. The no, no jerk policy. I, I agree with that for sure as well. I think probably most people do. The difficulty becomes in this. So maybe you can give advice on how we deal with this. So it's pretty easy if you identify, say, during the interview process, someone's a jerk. It's like, well, let's just not hire that person. That's an easy one. The problem is that most people put their best foot forward in an interview. You don't find out they're a jerk until later. And sometimes jerks are very high performers. They're, those aren't necessarily correlated. But the question is, when you have a jerk who is a high performer, what do you do? And how do you, like, what would your stance be on how you deal with that? Because sometimes it's not as easy as just terminate that person. Yeah, no, no, agreed. Because there, there is value to that, right? But I think that is why having our values be part of our feedback process. I mean, you get rated as a leader against those values. So one of our values is, is really leading and growing that, that you're, that you're really looking after your team, that you're, that you're leading by example, and that you're, you're conscious about growing your team members. And we've had occasion where there have been people that have been really strong in sales, but then we get feedback from their team. And it's like, there's a wake of bodies, right? Of people that are just unhappy about the way they're treated or they're not, they're not cared about. And they're, they're honestly has to have, you have to have conversations around that. And what helps is to be able to get information around how, how you're getting kind of, you know, scored on our values. So if, if there's just a lot of information in there about this person isn't helping me grow, that, that's really difficult for us, for us to continue to be able to have you lead our teams. Like it, it's kind of a non, you know, negotiable. So it helps to be able to have like tactical ways to review people and provide them feedback based on what you think is critical for them to succeed as leaders. You're describing that in the context of succeeding as leaders. Do you think that this applies even to the lowest ranks in a company or is it applied differently? Oh, oh, hundred percent. It, it, it absolutely does. Cause you see it, I think sometimes more prevalent in the, in the, you know, the, like the lower levels, just because they're trying to prove themselves so much. So, so like a part of our interview process, we actually have a happy hour. This is for campus hires. And it's not because we just want to hang out and drink. It's, not, it's, it's because we want to see how people act around groups around groups of people that are competing for the same thing. And so when you're in a group and you know you you want to promote yourself, but if you start to talk over people because you want the job, that for us is a red flag. So we're conscious about what we're looking for when it comes to getting people together. It's just you want those people that will take a step back and be conscious about someone's trying to ask a question or giving people opportunities to ask a question because you notice there's are three other people that haven't talked. It's little things like that that, that that we look out for even from the very beginning of someone's career because 
you know, that, that kind of approach and philosophy sometimes, whether it's school, how you grew up, whatever it is, it permeates. And so I think for us to be able to kind of look out for that as early as possible is, is critical, but we wouldn't be humans if we, you know, didn't have some sort of reaction towards those types of things. Yeah. Yeah. I've always felt like with interviews, there's, you know, the portion of the interview where you're sitting around a conference table and the person, you know, has their prepared, like, these are my three stories. I'm gonna make sure I tell. And, you know, you get that good stuff and there's some insights, but the real person I've found is the person who walks into that room, walks out of that room. Uh, those like moments in between, that's when you can really get to the heart of it. So I, I like having happy hours afterwards, even if it's just one person, just to be like, all right, let's be humans talking to each other now. Yeah. 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 Because this is, this is kind of your, your best foot forward, right? You're trying to, to get a job. And if you're still acting that way, what are you going to be after we actually hire you? <laughs> you know, right, so right. it only goes down from here. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, you know, I think, and I think there are, there are qualities in, in a resume that, that I find are, are kind of a, a good thread. Someone that's had to, had to like work through things, right? Meaning I had to work all throughout college. It's someone that just has that grit, that has that gratitude. I think that that's a big part of it. If you're just thankful for, you know, having an opportunity, it goes a long way. I think people that have worked or like played in, in sports teams, I mean, th there's just certain things when you kind of look at people's backgrounds and, and where they come from that does work in, in the consulting setting, you know, it, it gives us some indication of, of potential success. Do you think there's a commonality amongst all people who are in that sort of client facing consultative role? Not necessarily, you're talking about literally consultants, but many roles are consultative without needing to be consultants. Is there a common trait amongst what makes someone a successful consultant or is it more diverse than that? I think you have to have EQ. I think you have to be able to read people in a room. I think that there are people, and you know, I think I, obviously you have to be analytical. If you're not analytical, it's difficult to succeed in, in what we do. But I think that I've always said that people have come in with the best recommendations in the world, but if someone doesn't like you or, or you're not really acknowledging how potentially that person is reacting to you, they're going to hate it. And I've seen the converse. People were just the worst recommendations, but they're so likable. I was like, yeah, that sounds good. So th there, there is an EQ piece of it that you have to be able to relate to people. You have to understand the change that you're about to bring forward, what that means to them and, and guide them through that. And that has to come naturally. Like that's something that's really hard to teach. So, you know, the, just the overall desire to, to want to put yourself in someone's shoes, the ability to actually do it and then react based on that, I think it is, has been pretty critical when it, when it comes to being successful in this field. So you guys grew very, very quickly. I remember hearing you talk about when you were starting the company and then it was like a year later, I can't remember the exact timing, but it was, you were up to like 50 people within some, it was a year maybe. And then it was like a hundred people. And then it was, you grew really fast. What were the keys in your mind to achieving that type of growth within the type of company you were building? It's a, it's a combination. I think, you know, thankfully we had 15 years of a, of a reputation that preceded us. So in, in coming to the company, there were already people that knew they wanted to work with us. So our ability to be able to get service agreements, you know, with the major studios, that wasn't anything we were worried about because we had a reputation. So I think that really helped. I also think that our ability to grow from within, you know, our ability to have had people that have been with us as analysts who are now our, you know, principals and right hands, there is something about the DNA of growing up within this company. And thankfully we've had people that have stayed here for a while that allows you to then be leveraged because you can trust them in the way that they treat people and the way their values are and the way that they're going to, to be successful in their projects. So I think we've done a really good job with being able to foster that environment and thankfully, you know, get people that have been with us for decades at this point, being the ones that are leading our teams. I love it. Cool. Well, when we think about how do we build leaders that are then evangelists for the company and, and growing it themselves. I mean, obviously you had, you grew to a point where you had so many people that you weren't, you personally weren't interacting with everybody in the company all the time. And I'm sure you know everybody, but you probably don't have very much time with certain people in the company. So to, in order to do that, you need to build layers of leadership. Uh, what do you think is the key to building layers to leadership? You know, I think it's about gaining. It's always about trust. It's always the fact that you've done right by them. You know, it's it's always the fact that you've gone to bat for them when when you you you've needed to. I think being able to have just that loyalty to each other really gets to the point where, where people want to stay around because they know that you're going to continue to do right by them. So you know, when when I look at our leadership teams, I look at the folks that have been here for a long time. 
I just, I just feel like we, we've just created a really great relationship, right? I mean, we know who they are as people, we know who they are as consultants, and we've always, you know, just, they know our intent. They know that we're always going to do what, what is best for them. And there's always that open communication around that. So I, I, and it's also finding the right people, you know, it's finding the ones who have humility. It's finding the ones that are open to brand new analysts, giving ideas and knowing that that could be better than what our ideas are. So, you know, it's just, it's living our values, but it's, I, I don't know. I don't, you know, I wish there was like a, like a direct recipe to it, but a lot of times you, you kind of just, just fall in line with the right people who just, you, you know, they just click. What's so interesting about hearing you describe this is in one sense, these things seem like straightforward common sense. On the other hand, they seem very difficult to do. It's common sense, right? Like hire smart people, build trust with them and let them do their job. But on the other hand, most companies can't do that. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's back to that trust issue. I think it gets to a certain point, especially when you're building something and you grow so fast, you have to let go. You have no choice. I mean, unless I, I could figure out finally how to clone my myself and you know our leadership team, it's difficult to do. So you have to let go. And I think letting go and giving people the opportunity and that autonomy allows them to grow a lot faster, right? So I think it's it's also just knowing the right time to let go and just trusting people because if you pick the right people, they're going to grow into it and they're going to do it really well. And honestly, from my perspective, even better than what I could have done. And that's been you know again just really fulfilling. Just, just to watch those who maybe weren't as confident in the very beginning start to grow in confidence. And then all of a sudden they're just taking it over, right? It's That's pretty cool. So I, I think just trusting and just seeing where it goes and hoping for the best and having faith in it and it, it has honestly typically worked out for us. I, I love that idea, the, the even just the phrase, right? To grow, you have to let go. And that's, that's just such a powerful idea. Well, I always love chatting with you and I've learned so much from you today, as I always do whenever we chat. Is there anything else that we haven't talked about that you think we should as our time comes to a close here? Oh, gosh. No, I mean, we, we covered so many different grounds. You know, I think you started off about how it feels to be a woman in, in, in tech. I think what I, what I say to that is that I was lucky that I was raised in a family where I had a mom that, you know, she was one of the first female chief residents at Harvard. And I asked her, I said, how did you do it? How in the 1960s is an Asian woman, an immigrant, you know, she's barely five foot tall, not even, how do you make that presence? And she said, I never thought about it. I never thought the fact about the fact that I was a woman, I never thought about the fact that I was Asian, I never thought about any of that. I just thought I was a good doctor. So I think it also has to come down to the fact that we can't be hurdles for ourselves, right? We can't just think, oh, I'm a woman. That means I got to prove myself more. I think it's just having the confidence that you can do a really good job and so hopefully surrounding yourself with people, you know, male, female, or otherwise, <laughs> they just believe in you. And I think that's where I've been fortunate is I never questioned my abilities in being a consultant because I had good mentors. And so it wasn't about, oh, I'm a woman in tech. It's just like, oh, I'm good at this. And I just happen to be a woman. So I can, I can, you know, hopefully be just, just a model for how to do it and how to balance both the family and the, the work side of it. So I think more than anything, I just want to underline that, you know, I think as women, we shouldn't get in our own heads about, oh, this is a space where not a lot of us are in. Just, this is a space that you're in, like make that an opportunity and just do it. Don't overthink it. I love that. What what good advice. I'm sure there are plenty of people listening who that you know triggered some inspiring thoughts in them. So I love it. What a good note to end on. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for spending some time with us together today. It's been awesome. Thanks. For everybody else, if you want to learn more about what Candace is up to, just head over to tedharrington.com backslash podcast and we'll catch you next time. Crowdsec the collaborative and open source cybersecurity solution. Analyze behaviors, respond to attacks, and share signals across the community for free. Let's make the internet safer together. Learn more at crowdsec.net. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Tech Done Different Podcast with Ted Harrington. If you learned something new and this conversation made you think, then share itspmagazine.com with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to associate your brand with our conversations, sponsor one or more of our podcast channels. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. You can always find us at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. <laughs>